Let me just pop and change something for a moment. There we go. Will people's picture, uh, the people who are participating, will I be able to see their image uh, when they come on? Well, um, right now, what we have is um, people's video is off. If anyone would like, oh, to, I see. If anyone would like to deliberately, on, yeah, deliberately. Oh, okay. It doesn't matter to me. I just wondered. Yeah, Usually, yeah, when I do yeah, the Zoom, so, I see all the people. Right. Yeah, we do have more people coming on, but sometimes it it can be a distraction. So we've turned. Oh, off, okay. So we we've turned off the uh, the video, but people actually can turn their video back on. But what I would prefer to do is. If people have a question, maybe we'll just ask them to enter it into the chat room. Um, and that way uh, I'll be able to pose you the questions that come in from our audience. Oh, okay. All right, so I think we're gonna get started now. I just wanna say good morning to everyone um, and uh, welcome you all to this uh, fascinating uh, discussion of a fascinating film called Why the Jews, which was uh, created by Montreal filmmaker, John Curtin who has so generously given of his time, not only of his creative talent, uh, to have a, a, a little discussion with us this morning about the film, about his background and what inspired him to make the film and some of the conclusions that uh, he draws after the, making the film. So first, let me just uh, welcome you all. Uh, this is Rabbi Daniel Karapkin from Beth Avram Yosef of Toronto. And uh, Mr. Curtin was kind enough to uh, give the members of our shul the opportunity to watch the film. And now we're just going to discuss a little bit uh, of it uh, for those who have had the opportunity to watch. Uh, if you haven't yet watched the film, I certainly recommend it. And we're going to ask uh, John uh, in a moment to give us some um, uh, give us some information about where those opportunities are to watch the film. So first, let me read you uh, his bio. Uh, Montreal filmmaker John Curtin has 22 documentaries to his credit, including six biographies of famous Canadians and a four-part series on the British royal family. His films have won multiple awards and have been broadcast on CBC, BBC, ARD, NHK, ARTE, and others, uh, many of which I guess they're all acronyms, I suppose. He is currently working on a four-hour series for Discovery Plus, called Devil's Advocate, The Trials of Alan Dershowitz, which sounds really interesting. Uh, John freelanced for CBC, NPR, and the New York Times in Paris and West Berlin for five years, and later worked as a television reporter in Montreal. He has an honors BA and master's degree in English literature from the University of Toronto. Oh, good, you got some Toronto connection. He also studied at the Université de Poitiers in France and speaks fluent French and German. And as I'm sure you've detected, I speak neither of those fluently. John is a former national caliber distance runner and ran for Canada at the 1981 Maccabea Games in Israel. Kol to you, sir. He is the son of painter Isabel, is it pronounced Can? Yeah. And Viennese born photographer and Holocaust survivor, Walter Curtin, Ney Spiegel. Uh, welcome, John Curtin, and thank you so much, not only for being with us today, but for your body of work that has enriched society, no doubt. Um, we would, um, uh, so first of all, where are you located currently? I'm in the Plateau Montréal, which is kind of the center of, of Montreal, the, uh, not old Montreal, but very central. I actually grew up in Toronto and London, England, so I'm very familiar with Toronto. Well, great. So it's, it's the only place that hasn't shown the film. So you guys are the first to watch it other than on TV. Well, it's wonderful to have a fellow Canadian who's so accomplished. Um, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about, um, we, we, know, we know some of your, um, your credentials and what you've accomplished as a journalist and a, and a documentary maker. Tell us a little bit about what intrigued you about the condition of the Jewish people and why you decided to make this film. Well, probably what intrigued me the most that my father was a Viennese born Jew and yet uh, he married a Catholic who brought all, our, all his six children up Catholic. So we, my father would drive us to church 
but he'd never come in. He'd leave us there. So as the, you know, the Catholicism wore off in my late teens, I think for all us kids, you know, I, I and I think some of the other people in our family became more curious of my father's religion. And I was particularly interested in, in my father, I guess, uh, men are, or young men are. And uh, that led me actually to want to study German because he was obviously a German speaking uh, man, but he never talked German. So later I had the opportunity to move to uh, West Berlin. I was freelancing for CBC in Paris, moved to West Berlin at the time in the mid eighties. And that kind of triggered the thought of, making this film, believe it or not, way back then, the idea came to me. It just was simmering for maybe three decades. And you, if you ask me what that idea was, it was the surprising um, thing that I found that at least in West Berlin, um, Germans were very curious about Jews and not only curious, but very admiring. So even me, a half Jew, if you will, just with a Jewish father, not really Jewish at all. Um, they were intrigued. Like I was the first Jew they'd ever met, which is kind of sad, but, um, How many uh, you know, I, so I, I began thinking why they seem to admire Jews for their culture, their learning, their intelligence you know they had you know einstein in their head they had uh you know the great pianist Vladimir uh, horowitz who returned to berlin when i i was there to give his first concert so there was this great admiration and i was expecting you know maybe contempt and so that got me thinking of why are the jews so accomplished or at least in the eyes of germans and certainly i noticed my father's friends in london in toronto Etc. Many had many Jewish friends. I was impressed by their intellectual bona fides. So that just got me thinking: How did it come to be that such a small people is so accomplished? And that's kind of the genesis of the film that sowed the seed. And it took me many decades later uh, to actually have the courage to make the film because it's not an easy topic. Uh, let me go back to your father and your family for just a second. Um, how many siblings do you have, and did your father ever speak about his Judaism uh, and his uh, how he got out of Vienna? Uh, I assume he got out before the war or during the war? I think he was probably the last Jew to leave Vienna because he left on uh, March 31st, uh, 1939, which is many months after Kristallnacht, and uh, it, it, the gates were basically closed at that point, but he had some business connections to London, so instead of using the visa to Shanghai, which many Jews at that time in Germany and Austria uh, possessed, which would have allowed them to flee to Shanghai, he decided London would be a little more akin to his culture. And he went there. Uh, he didn't, like many Holocaust survivors, uh, he didn't talk a lot about uh, that when we were young, because it's a difficult topic to broach with children, but later, he did, and we were six children all together. And he talked later about, uh, you know, his mother being deported. I think the great drama of his life was that his, his mother didn't want to leave Vienna because she wanted to take care of their grandmother, her mother, and so stayed on. And the two boys, my father and his brother, left and. Uh, you know, inevitably everyone in, who stayed in Vienna was deported and, and killed. So I think he had a lot of guilt about abandoning his mother that, you know, it doesn't make any sense, but in a way it does because uh, um, you think you should stay on. Anyway, those kind of themes ran in kind of a dark, where he put a bit of a dark cloud of our family and maybe added to my curiosity to know more you know, why didn't this man who was German speaking speak German ever, et cetera, et cetera. So definitely was a big uh, uh, deal for me. Well, you and I have this in common. My mother left Germ uh, left Austria. She was also from Vienna. Oh. She, she left Vienna oh. in December of 38 on, on the kinder transport. Oh, okay. she, was, she was only a child. Oh. Um, to uh, Switzerland? No, or uh, well, she ended up in, in England, uh, first in London, and then she uh -huh. was in uh, Shefford in the countryside, 
because um, oh. London was being bombed. Yeah. And then, you know, and then she, she lived with the Gentile families for a while and then got into a Jewish orphanage and, and was raised Jewish, actually. But, um, you know, Vienna was a very cosmopolitan city and it had all different kinds of Jews. It had uh, religious Jews, it had secular Jews. And um, I, I'm just curious, um, have, have any of your other siblings taken an interest uh, in Judaism as you have, or is this is something that you just, just you've been interested in? Well, my, my brother a little bit, he actually looks more like my father, looks a little bit more Jewish than me, and he, he chose as a profession, a very Jewish profession. Uh, he's a very famous violin maker, in fact, he's one of the best in the world. Oh, wow. sold uh, violins to Yehudi Menuhin and some of the great violinists who are obviously, many of them are Jews. Um, you know, why was he, he attracted to the violin? I, I, I've heard that the violin is the sound of a Jew crying. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. So maybe that was some attraction, the melancholy of the instrument. Interesting. All right, so um, so it takes you just just uh, just before we go on, just one thing. I don't know if this you were alluding to this question, or maybe you asked me and I didn't answer. My father was a completely assimilated Jew, so it was typical. Vienna was full, full of Jews who really didn't go to synagogue. I mean, he would they would go to midnight mass at St. Stephen's Cathedral to kind of try and be part of the Austrian people who were predominantly Catholic and. Uh, so your uh, family to be uh, religious in Vienna was probably quite courageous. You would really be sticking out. Yeah, I in mean, a very yeah. anti-Semitic culture. Right. It was. It was definitely. I think it was definitely a minority in Vienna at the time. Um, and uh, and my mother relates how when uh, when her father was taking her and her siblings to the train station for the Kinder transport. Um, he was stopped by uh, a group of Nazis who, uh, who who tore off his beard because he was visibly Jewish. So I certainly understand how many how many many Jews in Vienna at the time and in Germany as well um, did whatever they could to to hide their Judaism out of certainly out of a fear of, of, of persecution. Did your father meet your mother uh, after the war? Uh, exactly. He went to England and she's English, so um, unusually an English Catholic. And uh, they got married, I guess, in 19, 1949. And uh, they eventually emigrated to Canada, partly over my, they didn't go to America, partly over my father's disgust that the American government hired so many. <laughs> Um, people who were involved, uh, well, not involved, indirectly involved with the German government during the Nazi period. They hired them in the space program and many scientists. Anyway, that's another story. But, uh. Okay, well, um, so, so, so you spend several decades having this question, why the Jews germinating within you and growing until finally uh, you decide to produce, using your talents as, as a filmmaker, to produce a, a film that really ponders the question, but it seems like the conclusion is, is that there really is no unitary reason that you can point to, to explain what makes the Jewish people stand out and lift far beyond their weight capacity. Would you like to reflect on that? Yeah, you know what, funnily enough, one of the first people, if not the very first person I interviewed in 2013 was Alan Dershowitz in, in Miami. And he said, you know, he gave me any number of reasons, uh, contributing factors, but he'd already thought a long time about this and actually wrote a, a chapter in a book uh, back in the 1990s dealing with it. And he said, ultimately, there is no answer. It's unclear. And I, I would have to agree with him after looking into it. I think after seeing the film, many people have a lot of questions that aren't answered. Perhaps not because there aren't some good answers in the film, but I, I didn't play up which I, what I think is the key reason because it's such a delicate matter is that elevated IQ, a lot of Jews, maybe don't even know it, but as a group, they have elevated IQ. The, 
How that came to be is the really interesting question of the film, in my opinion. You know, because you cannot separate IQ, general intelligence, from achievement. I have a lot of people think you can, but I, I, the science is pretty clear. So it's a delicate topic, and I, I kind of pussyfooted a little bit around it to maybe not get too many people's backs up so they at least all watch the rest of the film. And of course, Jews like to highlight more the cultural reasons, but I don't think they're sufficient to explain Jewish accomplishment. I mean, as, as um, yeah. So, so your conclusion is, is that it's not just nurture, a lot of it is nature, and that uh, genetically uh, Jews have uh, carried with them some kind of genetic quality that lends them to more, to a higher IQ. And, and did you find this to be only by Ashkenazic Jews mostly, or does it- Oh, well, well, you know, I didn't get into the possible difference between Sephardic and Ashkenazi Jews and IQ, et cetera. Interestingly though, Israel as a whole has a below the average IQ in Israel is below 100 and still does very, very well in the area of invention. So it's certainly not all, only IQ. But just before we get into that, I'd like to point out something that Charles Murray, a non-Jew, pointed out and probably didn't go in the film, that if you want to find out whether Jewish culture is responsible for Jewish accomplishment, just imagine a Gentile child adopted by a Jewish family. If you, if you say that it's mainly culture, that child should grow up with the same kind of elevated accomplishments as uh, Jews. And he said that's happened in many, 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 many cases. And there's absolutely no correlation, as would be perfectly obvious to anyone who thought about it, between uh, children that are adopted and, and, uh, and their adopted, uh, adopted parents. Obviously, there's no genetic link. Why would there be any uh, other link? So, um, that, to me, is a good way of uh, showing that culture plays a part, but it's not a huge part. I think uh, there, are, there are some things. Anyway, uh, there's so much to discuss there. I don't want to go on and on about it. I mean, it is, um, it, it's a very provocative kind of idea. We know that there are many other cultures that produce high IQs, especially in the Far East, and but there's something about Jews that makes them rise to certain prominent positions within society, um, sometimes much to our chagrin and embarrassment, but as much as to our chagrin and embarrassment, also to our pride. Um, and so in addition to IQ, there's got to be some other factor. Is it perhaps ambition? Is it greed? Is it, uh, uh, you know, how would you, how would you describe it, it as a sort of a, um, an adjunct to, to intelligence? I, I would pull out the word chutzpah, a little bit of audacity, uh, of not a, f a lack of fear of being different since the Jews were already ostracized and felt themselves to be other. Uh, they were less afraid of thinking differently. And I think the key to great uh, discoveries, invention is, is thinking a little differently from the average person, because thinking like the average person gets you uh, very average results. So there's, is there a genetic component to that though? Is there a genetic, perhaps a, a gene that uh, would lead someone to think differently, to think outside the box? Is that cultural totally? Or is there some weeding out? I would I would, I would just speculate that perhaps Jews have excellent uh, foresight. Now, now, why would that be the case? Well, if you think of um, there would be a certain winnowing through persecution, uh, there might be a reward for foresight, i.e. thinking down the line. And that's totally speculative. There's no, uh, no, nothing to prove that this is an idea I'd throw out there. Um, Obviously, it wasn't the kind of survival of the fittest that would produce this kind of thing, because, you know, a rabbi, a great thinker, a scientist would just as soon be cut down by the Cossack sword as the guy, you know, out collecting the garbage. So I don't think there's any premium to high intelligence or accomplishment when it's like a very brutal winnowing. 
but there might be something to the idea that there's uh, a reward for foresight. That actually, just to give an answer to how there was a selection for intelligence, I think Murray has a very good point when, when that uh, rabbinical ordinance came in after the destruction of the Second Temple in 70 CE, that raised the bar very high for a literacy, you know, that idea that all, at least all Jewish males and, and then females later uh, would have to become literate. It doesn't sound like a very high bar today, but perhaps um, that bar was too high for the average person. So the Jews self-selected, the more lazy intellectually among them drifted away from Judaism towards a less demanding religion, which would be Christianity, which was obviously a huge competitor. So that's kind of a, that's a very plausible scenario. And apparently the number of uh, Jewish population in the world declined significantly in those first uh, centuries of the common era. And not all of that can be attributed by uh, the Roman slaughtering Jews. It seems that many just drifted away from the faith. So you might have been left with that core of people who are really interested in learning you know, fascinated by it. So it was a kind of self-selection. I think that's a very plausible scenario. It's a contributing factor for sure, I would think. Right. So that that sense of obstinateness, that sense of chutzpah, as you pointed out, has stood well with for us, you know, for those Jews who have really stuck it through, you know, and, and actually as a rabbi, that's one of the arguments that I use for any Jew in our community who's, who's contemplating marrying out of the faith, one of the arguments, you know, in our arsenal to prevent intermarriage is look at the long link, the long chain of ancestors who through thick and thin were willing to die for their Judaism, and it's all going to end with you. It's all going to end with your line because you are willing to discard something that Jews held on for dear life at all costs. But let, I, what I, let me ask you something, John. Is, is there, and I know that you, it's, very, it's a very delicate subject, especially for someone who doesn't identify as Jewish to address, but isn't this idea of chutzpah or obstinateness, um, isn't it a double-edged sword? I mean, the Bible does describe the Jews as stiff-necked people, both for good and for bad. Uh, there have been many uh, very prominent Jews who through their Jewish uh, character have not only brought good things to the world, as you point out in your film, but have also brought very bad things to the world. I mean, we just have to think about people like um, uh, Marx and Lenin and, and, uh, and perhaps people in the pornography industry and, and, and so many other Jews who have risen to prominence in, in areas of life that we're not particularly proud of. Um, can you reflect on that as well, please? Yeah, you know what, I tried to, in order to diffuse what I thought would be a lot of blowback to this film. I thought of even, you know, featuring someone who was accomplished, but in a bad way, but it just somehow, you know, I think Noam Chomsky pointed out to me that most of the members of Murder Incorporated were Jewish. I never verified that, but, you know, it crossed my mind, should I put, a, you know, a famous criminal in there, but it just, it just didn't seem to work. I think everyone watching the film will be kind of intelligent enough to think that if you can put your skills uh, to use doing good, they can also be put to use being a criminal. So there's nothing necessarily, I mean, a great criminal is, you know, a mastermind in some ways. So yeah, I, I think that's a good point. Um, We'd like to think that Jews are mainly working for good, but you know, you only have to read a newspaper <laughs> on a regular basis to have some names leap out at you, particularly in the last year or two. It's interesting that you uh, that you featured Noam Chomsky. That was a bold move because Chomsky is not viewed with great fondness by the by the mainstream Jewish community because of his strong anti-Israel views. Um, did yeah, you, you know what? I actually use Chomsky as the kind of bad guy it's for coverage on the left, because I know that the left 
who would have a tendency to have problems with the, the, the film, and they did. But I thought, why not use their great icon against them a little bit, or at least put it in to, you know, make it seem a little more fair. Um, so, you know, Chomsky is a very anti-Jewish, anti-Israel kind of person. I mean, he's bordering on, some people think, anti-Semitism himself in some of the things he's done. But in other ways, he's a very admirable man, certainly has millions and millions of followers, particularly among young people. So I thought it was, I thought the fascinating thing that I would wanted to tell people, first of all, that Chomsky's Jewish. A lot of people did, don't know that, believe it or not. My brother didn't even know that Noam Chomsky's Jewish. <laughs> I guess if you listen to him, you, you would think he's not. Um, so just to say he's Jewish, and he's so steeped in Judaism. I mean, his father was, a lex I believe, a, a Hebrew lexicographer. It's, you know, he speaks, spoken fluent Hebrew since he was a child. He went to the same Zionist Hebrew uh, summer camp as Alan Dershowitz. He was Alan Dershowitz's camp counselor when Alan was 10. Chomsky was 20. So I kind of like the idea of telling people, well, A, Chomsky's Jewish, and B, he's absolutely steeped in Judaism, and three, uh, C, that, um, you know, he announced at the end of the interview, one of his, you know, on his bucket list was to go back and read the entire Bible in the original in Hebrew. And uh, I thought that's surprising for a man who people consider so anti-Jewish that his last project seemed to be go back and read the Hebrew Bible. Yeah, and a, a, lot of, um, a lot of Jews who identify as secular have a sort of a love-hate relationship with Judaism um, because they, you know, uh, uh, Marx uh, himself said that uh, religion is the opiate of the masses, but at the same time, it, it is sort of the, uh, the, the magnet that has kept the Jewish people together. I, I don't think that it would even be possible for Judaism or the Jewish people to be what they are today without the religious component, and that's what some of the um, some sort some some of these anti-Semitic or you know who have a love-hate relationship with their Judaism fail to see is that without religion there is no Jewish people, right? So yeah, exactly. It is very intriguing in some ways. To disconcerting to see so many Jews uh, counterintuitively arguing, being more critical of Israel, for instance, than, than non-Jews, or being more critical of certain aspects. I think it probably, you'd have to, it's hard to psychoanalyze people, but it probably comes from a sense of guilt or a sense of fear of the Gentile. Uh, if I'm more critical of Israel, uh, I'll be admired by Gentiles somehow. I don't think it actually helps at all. I mean, it, just like it didn't help the Jews of Austria to be assimilated. They were all sent to camps, the religious with the completely assimilated. So actually, I don't think this is a winning strategy to be so critical of your own culture, but it's certainly a fact of, uh, of Judaism and somewhat surprising to the outside world. Can, can you reflect a little bit on your relationship with Alan Dershowitz? You, you mentioned in your biography that you're working on a four-hour series called Devil's Advocate, The Trials of Alan Dershowitz. And I noticed that he plays prominently in, in the film. Um, what is it that drew you to Dershowitz? Um, and, and do you feel that he typifies this kind of um, a quality among the Jewish people to, to sort of emerge and become prominent within society? I think uh, Alan Dershowitz is uh, uh, enormously unusual among Jews. He's just one of the very, very few who just wants to, feels that he can say whatever he wants about Israel in its defense and doesn't have to take into account what Gentiles think. I think he makes a real point of not whether he's talking about Trump, which some people hate him for, or, you know, he's defending Jeffrey Epstein as a defense lawyer does. And he just refuses to, um, how can I put it, just uh, kowtow to other people's thinking. He thinks he has a right to say it this way. So 
Uh, I find him, he's not only an amazing defense uh, attorney, appellate attorney, but he's also very knowledgeable about, about Judaism. He's very proud of being Jewish, he's, and he's not afraid of attacking non-Jews and Jews alike. So he's just as much at Noam Chomsky's throat as he will be at the throat of anti semite And he's so provocative, that's what makes him interesting. Most people probably are too young for this on, uh, on this panel, but uh, way back in the 70s, he was defending the right of neo-Nazis to march through a Holocaust community. Not that he was in favor of neo-Nazis, he's just a big, you know, First Amendment rights guy. So he, people, uh, not everyone, uh, I think Jews particularly either love or hate Alan Dershowitz because he's so outspoken, he embarrasses some, he's, he makes others proud. So he's a very, he's a bit of a lightning rod and, and a certainly a fascinating person to do a, a documentary about. I, I put him in the film. I had to stop him from dominating the film because he had so many ideas about Jewish accomplishment. So I only could put him in for eight or 10 minutes in that one. And this time he'll have a little more, uh, he'll have a little more time dedicated to him. So I don't know if that'll make this panel happy. I know a lot of people don't like him. What do you think of Alan Dershowitz? I, I, uh, well, I, it's, it's a mixed bag with Alan Dershowitz. I mean, remember, I remember him being part of the O.J. Simpson defense team, and that made me upset. I remember him uh, defending certain liberal causes that I wasn't a fan of. But, and then more recently, uh, I've been very proud of him for standing up for more conservative uh, political platforms, uh, because that's where more I identify with. But at the same time, he's, uh, you can't help but admire his chutzpah, as you talked about before, just to uh, not, as you say, not be uh, guarded in what he says and what he does, because he sees, and he's unabashedly proud of his Judaism, which is something that uh, uh, we wish more Jews would, uh, would, would, would emulate. Uh, you, one of the other things I remember about your film is that you, and but you really only touched on it, which is the idea of comedy sort of emerging from Jewish suffering. You featured uh, Jerry Seinfeld and, um, and, and you touched on it a little bit. Is, do you find that, um, that Jewish comedy is different from other kinds of comedy and, and, uh, and, and th that, uh, that comedy does emerge from tragedy? I think it probably does, but I, I didn't actually have time to go into all these areas. That's the subject of a whole film, and I think there have been some films just dedicated to Jewish humor. I think one was made by a Torontonian quite recently, which I saw. So I didn't really get into that, but yeah, for, for sure, uh, Jewish comedians are legion, and presumably a lot of their humor comes from... Um, well, it's a kind of dark humor it comes from a place of pain. I remember, not everyone will laugh at this joke, but I remember one of my father's favorite uh, cartoons was in the New Yorker and it's two Jews out in the Siberia chipping away at a rock <laughs> in whatever minus 30 degrees and horrible conditions. And one says to the, the other, remember the good old days in Auschwitz. <laughs> So that's a very dark joke, but it's something that my mother, my father, who was a Holocaust survivor, some found something funny about that. So, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of dark humor that uh, that you have to sort of have lived through it in order to be able to appreciate the humor. Um, I, I think uh, maybe I'll just ask you one more question, and then we'll open up for the for the questions. There's a number of questions for sure. What we're seeing today is that a whole new generation of Jews have entered into this uh, much more, you know, online society where people are no longer uh, as tribal, at least Jews are no, no longer as tribal as they used to be. And I'm just wondering, from your perspective, do you feel that there's uh, this edge that Jews have, uh, which is the topic of why the Jews? Are we at risk of losing that edge as we sort of venture out more and more into uh, into secular society, or is that is that 
unique feature of Judaism going to be preserved regardless of how assimilated Jews, Jews become? Well, that's a tough one. Uh, uh, Alan Dershowitz, to bring you up one more time, has already written a whole book about the vanishing American Jew in 1996. So that's a huge topic. Um, I think Jewish genius is still going to be around for a while. Um, if, if you think of it as being totally genetic, then, you know, there would have to be some dilution through intermarriage, but, you know, smart people tend to marry other smart people. So, uh, so a little bit of extra, you know, new blood, if you will, uh, might help things along. Um, whether Judaism as a religion survives, I mean, all religions are a, a bit under siege today, or at least are losing followers, but Jews have done an amazing job of staying together for so long. I don't think they're going to suddenly disappear because of Facebook or, or the internet or whatnot. In fact, it may be, you know, I think there, these things come and go, you know, um, religiosity may skip a generation. So what we perceive as a trend may be reversed in 10 or 20 years. Um, I, uh, I, I certainly wouldn't like to consider myself an expert on, on predicting any history, let alone Jewish history. But if, uh, you know, the past is probably to the future, I think Judaism will be around for hundreds of years and the Jews will still be throwing off great uh, genius uh, for many years to come. I've been keeping track of the Nobel Prize winners just in the last few years because I was afraid as I started this film, that suddenly they would drop off. But no, uh, I think the average over the last seven years is at least 25% of the Nobel Prize is going to Jews. Wow. Um, so I, I would say the Jews aren't vanishing anytime soon or, or assimilating completely anytime soon. One of the interesting phenomena that we're seeing in North America is that we're seeing a polarization of the Jewish community that the less religious are becoming even less religious and the more religious are becoming even more religious. They're moving more to a more wow. fundamentalist form of Judaism as a way of preserving what they fear will be lost because of this globalized, you know, the global community that's online. So yeah, I, I, I happen to agree with you that Judaism will always endure. It may um, um, evolve and change based upon what are the perceived threats to religion uh, in society at large, but it'll always remain intact. Yeah. I give you, I just thought of this, but uh, this is, might be encouraging for, for you. My father was a third generation of assimilated Jew. You would think that he would have nothing in him. And then he married a Catholic and he had a bunch of children who were brought up Catholic, went to Catholic schools, went to mass every Sunday for 20 years or whatever. And yet I, you know, I was interested enough to make this film. I feel very Jewish myself. So, you know, if that's not a tribute to the lasting nature of Judaism through something, it's not very cultural because I had no Jewish culture, but the, there's something in the blood or in there's some pull towards Judaism. It must be pretty strong if it survived all those generations of assimilation. And still, children of a man who married a Catholic is still feeling Jewish. I remember, perhaps you remember the name of the author, but there was a book called Turbulent Souls that was published by a New York Times I know. author. He also talked about that idea about the, there's something in the blood that travels from generation to generation, regardless of the different twists and turns that occur in the family line. So certainly that's a very uh, resonant idea. All right, let me open up. I mean, you talked about the Nobel Prize winners. We have a question here in our chat. Is there a risk that Jewish pride can overstep its boundaries? I have seen comments on Jewish Nobel websites which denigrate other religions for not producing as many winners as us. So is there, is there, uh, yeah, is there a danger? Yeah, you know what, that's exactly the kind of triumphalism I tried to keep out of the film. I didn't have anyone, I didn't want to be perceived as cheerleading 
for a group of people. So I just tried to keep that out. Obviously, any comment, I, I, I absolutely kept out any comparisons with any other group, uh, except there's a little bit about Asians being inspired by Judaism, particularly in Korea. Um, so, uh, no, obviously, that's, that's not the kind of thing to, to say. And I think... Murray, Charles Murray has it right. You know, it's just some Jewish accomplished just something for other people to celebrate. Because apart from the people who did bad things, the vast majority of Jewish discovery has helped not just Jews, but the whole world. In fact, the Nobel Prize, I don't know if everyone knows it, is given to the person or people who contribute, do something which contributes the most to humanity. So the fact that Jews have won those in such great numbers is, is certainly a, a, a tribute, but I think, you know, there shouldn't be a beating of chess and you can be quietly proud. And I think that's what most Jews are. Yes, yes, uh, point, point well, well stated. Uh, next question, uh, great film with interesting perspectives and illuminating insights, but I found the end quite jarring. The final image was of a child with a tattoo from the camps and an explanation of the root of anti-Semitism. What led to your choice as this, as the final image and takeaway? You know what, a few people have, have called me out on that. It's a very dramatic way to end the film. The, the film was not about anti-Semitism or persecution, but I don't think you can treat any Jewish topic without you know, avoiding the Holocaust or Jewish persecution. So eventually you have to get around to it. And both Alan Dershowitz and uh, a rabbi in Montreal, Rabbi Ruben Apupko, is quite well known in, in Montreal, pointed out that Jewish accomplishment they thought was the flip side of anti-Semitism, uh, i.e. it was a kind of envy that was created. And certainly I find that quite compelling and I wanted to put it in the film that it, oddly enough, these very things that Jews are most proud of, you would think would be most celebrated by the rest of the world, but it seems like they antagonize, that in many cases, uh, these great accomplishments antagonize the world. It's, it's, it's an odd thing. And, but I couldn't leave this topic without mentioning it. And I thought it was a very dramatic way to end the film, which would lead people to think a bit more about that as they went about their day or left the theater or whatever. Uh, our next question is from someone uh, probably who's been thinking a lot about Rabbi uh, Jonathan Sachs, who was the chief rabbi of, mm. of the UK, who passed away tragically uh, very recently. And one of the things that Rabbi Sachs spoke about so, uh, so eloquently was the innate desire within the Jew to change the world. And... Um, why do you, it, it, first of all, do you agree that that is part of the persona of the Jew and that, that which drives the Jewish mind to, to rise to prominence in society? And, and would you reflect on perhaps if there is a source for that? What makes the Jew want to make the world a better place? Certainly, if anyone knows why the world's a bad place, that would be Jews. So uh, making it better would be partly just uh, self-preservation to improve their lot. In fact, you know, there's a theory that um, Jews are behind leftist movements, the idea of communism, the idea of mankind uh, becoming a brotherhood, if you will, that's kind of a Jewish idea. So I think, I, you know, far be it for me to point out what drives Jews, but I, I would have to agree with Rabbi Sachs, a wonderful person. I only learn because I'm doing this from Elaine, that, that uh, Rabbi Sachs had died. I had no idea he died. Uh, a great man and um, very sad to hear that. He was not, couldn't have been more in his late 60s, or early 70s. He was well, in his early 70s. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, very sad. Incredibly eloquent uh, man. And um, yeah. And uh, in fact, yeah. I'm sorry, thank you for mentioning Elaine Genesov. Uh, I want to thank Elaine for uh, organizing uh, this interview and the showing of the film for today. Um, 
Uh, Elaine is, uh, is an amazing member of our congregation who usually gets most of these kinds of programs done with ease and aplomb. Um, another question from uh, uh, one of our, our viewers is if you could uh, please talk a little bit about some of the challenges you faced during the editing process. What, 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 what didn't make the film? What is on the, what is on the cutting room floor <laughs> that you had to remove? Well, the, the main challenge was trying to um, narrow down the areas that I would focus on because you, you know, it's an hour and a half film approximately how many characters, how many Alan Dershowitz can go into it, uh, probably seven or eight, and then trying to say, well, yes, the law is a very important area for Jews, but medicine is too. There's no great doctor in the film. So a lot of it was before I got to editing, I decided, having to decide what to shoot. And the, I wanted to find the most accomplished person in each area. So I started at the top in terms of uh, requesting interviews. I realized that a lot of people would not like to be in this film uh, talking about, you know, why they're a quote unquote genius or whatever. So I expected a lot of no's. There were some no's, but uh, most of the people, including uh, Jonathan Sachs, were very, are very, very, busy people. So it was very, very difficult to, uh, you know, nail them down for an interview wherever in the world. I mean, Jonathan Sachs actually, after writing to him maybe two years in a row, we arranged various places and everything always fell through. And then suddenly, you know, can you come to New York? I uh, can see you in Washington Square between 8 and 9 p.m. or something. So everything was very difficult for this film setting it up. The, the one that I'm most proud of and happiest about, because I was lacking, you know, great Jewish women, and I knew of this absolutely amazing woman in Budapest, the greatest chess player of all time, woman chess player of all time, Judith Polgar, a lovely person, hyper intelligent. I wanted her, but she turned me down in writing two, three times. And eventually, after two years, she said, oh, you can come to Budapest on Thursday. <laughs> it was like Monday and I was flying to Berlin the next day. So each one of those people was uh, that's featured in the film was relatively hard to track down. And uh, so it was a, it was a hard film to make it. And perhaps I'm missing out. The hardest part is that a lot of people just looked at you funny, <laughs> like you're making a film. But what? It's very not politically correct to talk about how one people might be different from another in any way, shape or form, let alone uh, when you're talking about accomplishment and let alone when you're talking about any genetic factors like IQ. It's, so it, it was it actually was a tough film to make. Mm. Well, I certainly, uh, when I was watching the film, I was at the same time uh, looking at this Netflix program about about uh, famous uh, female uh, chess players, so it was a very very timely insertion about uh, uh, about having this uh, very very uh, famous uh, female chess player who's Jewish and talk about her Judaism. Um, what, another question: uh, Your film and also Paul Johnson's uh, History of the Jews ends with the thought that perhaps the only explanation of Jewish survival and why the Jews is that they were in fact chosen by God. Uh, can you comment on this, difficult as that may be? It's funny, I mentioned that to my mother who's a devout Catholic and she said, of course, <laughs> they chosen people. So yeah, that obviously is an incredibly provocative statement. But even, well, actually, I, you know, I talked to Paul Johnson. I, did he mention that in the film? Uh, I, I, he may have mentioned it to me. I don't think I included that in the film, or did I? Anyway, it was Shimon Perez who, 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 who talks about that at the end, you know, asking if we were chosen, or were we chosen to suffer? Were we chosen to... But he concluded that they were Jews, at least in Shimon Perez's view, Jews were there to set a high moral example. Uh, to the world, which is also a very provocative idea, but it's it's the one I'd like to believe in. Mm. How would you account, another person asks, uh, how would you account for the involvement of Jews in the arts 
Uh, one can understand that a quick wit would be beneficial to the historically oppressed Jewish person, but of what benefit is the desire for the achievements in the arts? That's where it's very, it's inexplicable. But if you go back to the core um, idea that general intelligence or IQ makes is good for everything, uh, it's, it, it really helps in every field of endeavor. Even a high IQ bus boy, <laughs> one of the jobs I had when I was younger, um, is advantageous to have an IQ if you're just uh, putting glasses, you know, serving glasses of water at the appropriate moment on the table. So uh, if Jewish IQ is high, and it is, that certainly helps in all areas. However, the artistic thing is more uh, imaginative, creative area. That's more difficult to argue. Yes, who knew it? Who would have think, thought it? But uh, half of the great photographers of the 20th century have been Jewish American photographers. There's countless. Why is that the case? Who knows? It's a mystery. I guess the fact that you ultimately can't answer this question makes it an interesting film to tackle because it leaves everyone thinking, how could that be? I would imagine that intelligence is not uh, monolithic and that different, uh, different uh, intellectual endowments lead to different intellectual uh, pursuits. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the things that a lot of Jews think about, and this is reflected in Sheila's question that I'm about to, to articulate, is that we think that we look at all of the achievements of Jews who have left Judaism and have made great contributions to the world. People like Jonas Salk and, and Albert Einstein and all of these Nobel Prize winners. And one sort of is a, a, a Jew of faith looks at this with great conflict because on the one hand, what if Albert Einstein would have stayed in the yeshiva and would have become a great rabbinic scholar uh, we would have lost the theory of relativity. <laughs> and so here is the greater yeah. contribution. Um, and so the way that she phrases the question is, does religious Judaism hold back a great accomplishment? But the flip side is, does great uh, secular accomplishment hold back Judaism? I mean, you could, you could ask the question in both ways, I suppose. Yeah, I think the second might be true, but you'd be a better judge of that. Um, there are great Jewish religious thinkers. I'm sure there's enough to go around here. But it is true. In fact, once again, not to mention again, but Alan Dershowitz has thought long and hard about this. He himself was an Orthodox Jew and kind of left the faith. Um, and he said, you know, it's counterintuitive. Why, if Jews give you the you know, Judaism gives you that core strength or whatever it is to go out in the world and accomplish great things. Why are the most accomplished Jews not very religious? And he thinks, he posits, he hypothesizes that the most, I guess, I guess the most daring, the most questioning Jews uh, are led to leave their faith. And uh, those are the then become geniuses in the outside world. But uh, who knows? It is a fact that a lot of uh, accomplished Jews are, are assimilated. Yeah, interesting. Um, uh, uh, Paul asked the following question, and, and I think the question is actually more revealing of a certain uh, mindset within many Jews in the world today who are concerned about anti-Semitism and wish to put an end to anti-Semitism. And to that end, you know, we as Jews sometimes introspect as might we be the cause by behaving in a certain way of anti-Semitism. And so the question therefore is, is there a way that Jews can contribute uh, to the reduction of anti-Semitism? Is there a way perhaps if we behaved with more, what he calls more humanity or humility and uh, avoiding causing the jealousy that may lead to anti-Semitism. To what degree do oh you my God, that's, contribute to anti-Semitism? That's, that's a great question. You know, anti-Semitism is a great a, a mystery as Jewish accomplishment. That's why I think they're somewhat linked. I don't think anti-Semitism will ever go away. I mean, it's, that's why I say I don't think Jewish accomplishment will go away. 
And I don't think there's anything Jews can do in and of themselves to rid the world of anti-Semitism. It doesn't help to assimilate like my father did as many Austrian and German Jews. They just forgot their religion, went to church, did everything like that. That didn't help at all. Uh, yes, other people think by sticking out, by being, uh, being orthodox, you know, that's a provocation to the Gentiles. So you shouldn't, shouldn't do that. It doesn't help. Um, so I have no idea how to end anti-Semitism. Certainly you would think that by doing good things for humanity, that would help. It seems that it's uh, more often than not treated as a provocation. Yeah. And um, most of the um, prejudice against Jews simply aren't true if you look closer at them. I mean... You know, when you look at it, Jews are the most generous people in the world, if you look at it in terms of contributions to charity. And yet, the you know, the anti-Semite would have them being the opposite. So most of this is all anti-Semitism, mostly based on fake news, right? But look how many people are, are prepared to believe fake news these days, and you could only throw up your hands in despair. I don't think anti-Semitism... Will, will, it will be around a, a even if there are no more Jews left on earth because you hear about it in, in certain places where there aren't any Jews left on earth and people are still cursing the Jews. Yeah, and it is a vicious cycle because um, Jews have had to uh, become more cunning and smarter than the rest of society as a result of their persecution. And so those who suggest that uh, there's a way that Jews can, uh, can reduce anti-Semitism, while it's not completely without merit, obviously we as Jews do get embarrassed when there is a prominent Jew in a headline who does something that is, uh, is quite bad and, we're, and is very embarrassing and very damning. But at the same time, to talk about humility or to talk about... Um, you know, certain overarching characteristics, it's very difficult to, to portray that as a solution when many of these characteristics emerged as a result of great persecution. And we, when we really had, this, these were survival mechanisms that were built into our, our national persona. Um, I, we're, we're coming up very close to the end of the hour and, and you've been so generous with your time. I, I wanna take this opportunity to thank you for, oh. for, for A, making the film and giving us a tremendous amount of opportunity to discuss these very important issues. A very complicated film, a very complicated topic. And I can only say that uh, I, I wish you all of God's blessings should befall you, that, uh, that you continue to make films of this nature that really challenge us and, uh, and, and bring, uh, bring us uh, uh, glory and and things to think about for the future. I'll leave you with one final question and give you the last word, uh, John Curtin. And that is if, if using your, your crystal ball um, and seeing how there have been seismic shifts, not only in the, the larger world, but also uh, between diaspora Jewry and Jews in Israel. Now, the largest population of Jews in the world today for the first time ever uh, in modern history is in, is in the state of Israel today. Where do you see uh, Jews in 10 to 20, the Jewish world in 10 to 20 years from now? Will it be the same? Will, how, how will it be different? And how will this, how, what will the state of Israel look like in, uh, in, in a generation from now? Oh my God. Well, thank you very much for the kind words. Those are, that's probably the most difficult question. I am unable to predict uh, what will happen tomorrow or next week, either on the stock market or <laughs> politically, although I did uh, predict the demise of Donald Trump uh, as soon as he was sort of elected, said he would be a one term. So occasionally I get those uh, predictions right. Where I think Israel will continue to thrive, actually. Uh, I think these this latest step of being... Um, uh, of the Emirates coming in and recognizing Israel probably lead to a widespread recognition of Israel in the Middle East. I think that's 
even good for the Palestinians, although it's a bit counterintuitive. It looks like they're being abandoned. I think that'll put a lot of pressure on the Palestinians to come back to the table. So I see good things uh, happening in Israel, provided there are no, you know, cataclysmic disasters, which you always have to keep your fingers crossed. And as I say, I don't worry about Jews in the diaspora. Um, I think they will continue to co accomplish uh, things. And there could be even an argument for being among the other, being among Gentiles is, is, is a little bit of a foil for them. It helps them to, you know, uh, it's a good, the Gentiles are a good sparring partner for the Jews. So the Jews in the diaspora continue to spar with the Gentile and outperform them often. And I think Israel will do just fine. John Curtin, thank you so much. We'll look, we'll look, look forward to uh, your uh, Devil's Advocate, The Trials of Alan Dershowitz uh, miniseries, as, as well as all of your other great work. And I uh, want to thank everyone for joining us on this Sunday morning. God bless everyone and have a great week. Thank you so much.